Well, here we are. Um, we've sort of said, we, we've been talking a lot about the hippocampus and mentioning that <clears throat> diabetes selectively has a role to play in damaging the hippocampus. This whole issue of upregulating the flow of uh, calcium into the uh, neuron and its effect in terms of damaging that. Um, I was asked during the break about glutamine and do we use it as a supplement. And yes, I mean, we use L-glutamine in bowel issues. Uh, we know that there is conversion of glutamine to glutamate, and glutamate is not the problem. Although it's considered an excitatory transmitter, as Dr. Blaylock will be talking about, it's not the glutamate that's the problem. It's the fact that the receptor becomes excessively sensitive to glutamate, and the receptor becomes sensitive because of mitochondrial dysfunction. So the proximate problem is the mitochondropathy, the mitochondrial dysfunction. Well, I'm going to focus on the role of stress and how stress is involved in damaging the hippocampus and uh, how that relates to ultimately can relate to Alzheimer's disease and maybe even has a role to play in why diabetes, another pathway by which diabetes affects the brain. <clears throat> Let's get to the adrenal glands, but we're going to get there from the brain through the hypothalamus, and we know that the hypothalamus uh, affects the pituitary gland in relation to the adrenals by secreting something called corticotropin releasing factor. That goes to the, to the pituitary gland that then secretes adrenal, uh, adrenal corticotropic hormone. So this is the higher calling here that actually sets the pace for uh, the pituitary's involvement in uh, affecting how the adrenal works, then the adrenal glands way down yonder produce cortisol and as you would then expect cortisol feeds back to the hypothalamus and this is a classic feedback loop. As cortisol increases then the hypothalamus would obviously decrease its corticotropin releasing factor. You know it's the same pathway as for example thyrotropin releasing factor affecting thyroid hormone which then feeds back uh, etc. This is a classic feedback pathway. But what we're going to learn is that the set point for this whole activity is governed by the hypothalamus, that it plays a very important role. And that above the hypothalamus, incredibly, the hippocampus governs the sensitivity of this whole system. That the ultimate bo governing uh, body here is the hippocampus. That that very area of the brain that deals with memory functions in addition to serve as the um, the governor, the regulator of the whole level of activity of the hypothalamus uh, affecting ultimately the production of cortisol. And that when there is hippocampal degeneration and dysfunction, as we see in Alzheimer's, for example, that we lose this uh, the set point sensitivity issue and this system goes uh, on unbridled, becomes hyperactive, increasing the production of CRF and ultimately increasing cortisol. And what we're going to learn is that cortisol selectively damages the hippocampus. So this then becomes yet another what's called feed-forward cycle. Well, this is a wonderful book by Dr. Robert Sapolsky looking at the effect of stress and how it affects the brain and what ultimately leads to the death of uh, neurons and how stress plays such an important role uh, in this uh, whole pathway. We know that the hippocampus then mediates this negative feedback. It sets, it's the set point governor of this whole activity. It acts as what we call a supra hyperthalamic break. In an article that I'll show you in a, in a minute, I think dealing with multiple sclerosis, they say that, uh, well, we know that there's uh, problems from higher brain centers that affect the set point. The higher brain center is the hippocampus. With damage, there's less inhibition of this axis leading to glucocorticoid hypersecretion. So damage to the hippocampus leads to excessive glucocorticoid activity, excessive adrenal function. And the hippocampus, so, uh, therefore, we know, therefore, because of its role, regulates glucocorticoid response uh, in the stress response and also has a critical role, as we've talked about extensively this morning, in cognition and memory. Well, what would be this relationship? Why would we want to, what would be the relation between the stress response and memory? I mean, why would the physiology be such that these two uh, actions would be mediated by the same locus? Well, basically, because if you have a stressful event, you need to remember it. If, if um, you're chased by a lion in a certain area of the forest, you should not go there again. 
So the fact that uh, this stimulates the fight or flight, you know, your adrenals are turned on, also uh, challenges you to remember that experience, and that's a, a survival uh, issue. So then again, uh, this is where the hippocampus is located on the medial aspect, mesial aspect, the uh, in, in insular part of the temporal lobe. And again, uh, this is what it looks like on a coronal uh, uh, CT scan. <clears throat> it's been understood for a long time that issues that damage even the blood supply to the hippocampal region are associated with uh, persistent memory deficits, presumably due to damage to the blood supply uh, uh, to the hippocampus and the fornix and mammalothalamic pathways that are adjacent to the third ventricle. And in aneurysm surgery for many years, um, uh, in areas like the anterior cerebral arteries, anterior communicating arteries, patients would survive their aneurysm surgery but would be left with significant memory deficits. And it was d discovered about 32 years ago that indeed on the back side of the anterior cerebral artery and anterior communicating arteries are a splay of arteries uh, that actually supply this region which were compromised by the surgery. And I'll show you that in just a moment. But here is the hippocampus, the original seahorse. And again, as mentioned, here is the hippocampus looking like a seahorse. There's the eye this time, so we've made progress. So any sustained stress then leads to, as we would expect, glucocorticoid hypersecretion. So when you're under stress, you, uh, when you're giving a lecture for eight hours in a day, your cortisol level goes up. What can I say? You know, it happens. <laughs> so you have to protect your hippocampus because your hippocampus gets damaged ultimately by this glucocortico glucocorticoid hypersecretion. And this <clears throat> normally leads to, uh, I mean, it does lead to loss of these hippocampal corticoid receptors, and that leads to further increased corticoid uh, hypersecretion. So, <clears throat> stress damages the hippocampus, and because the hippocampus is the governor over the sensitivity of the system, and when you release that, you have more corticoid hypersecretion. And when you look at glucocorticoid secretion on an ACTH challenge test on uh, Alzheimer's disease patients, uh, and even in normal aging, this test goes up higher and higher as we age, much more dramatically so in the Alzheimer's patient, and I'll show you that in just a moment. We develop what's called negative feedback insensitivity. It just doesn't know, it doesn't know how to shut itself off anymore. Well, what do we inhibit by glucocorticoids? We're all familiar with the immune effects, um, the growth hormone effects, um, IGF effects, protein synthesis. We're all familiar with uh, classic Cushingoid uh, issues that we see in patients with Cushing's syndrome or whom receive uh, prednisone or other uh, corticoids uh, for whatever autoimmune problem you're treating. Uh, and again, elevated adrenal uh, function, we see these typical things. Um, Interestingly enough, obviously diabetes, and we're going to find out uh, more about this relationship in just a moment in a much more uh, aggressive way. But let me just focus for a moment on immune function uh, because there seems to be uh, sort of a push to be placing people on low dosage glucocorticoids these days uh, because of so-called adrenal failure uh, issues, uh, you know, people with fatigue and other uh, issues that people are ascribing to the adrenal gland and then uh, using uh, Cortef uh, or cortisone acetate in low dosages, there are downsides to that, and I think that we have to consider that that's a powerful immune-suppressing uh, event. That <clears throat> looking at uh, tumor growth just based upon stress. Now, stress increases glucocorticoid production. In a young animal, if you implant in a, in a uh, experimental animal tumor, a young animal will grow some tumor. If you stress that young animal, the rate of tumor growth is increased because you're increasing the um, glucocorticoid production. An old animal whose uh, immune system is compromised has a, a worse, uh, has a higher growth of tumor compared to the young animal, but an old stressed animal is in real trouble in terms of tumor growth. So again, we have to think about what we're doing, not just in terms of the immune system, but in terms of the hippocampus and favoring it, what's called a feed-forward cycle. When there is sustained stress, ultimately, these glucocorticoids become neurotoxic and damage the hippocampus.